Greetings, I'm Evan Swenson. I'm an author and a book publisher. I'm also the developer of Author Mastermind, sponsors of Readers and Writers Book Club. Welcome to Readers, Writers, and Book Club. You're invited to come along with us as we visit with and learn more about the amazing Author Masterminds authors. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to Readers and Writers Book Club. Uh, we're going to have some fun today. We're talking today with Rich Ritter. Rich, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Evan. It's nice to be here with you today. Likewise. Yeah, yeah. I have a photograph here, uh, Rich. Uh, I suspect that you're down in Juneau right now. I'm in Anchorage, Alaska. You're in yeah. Juneau, Alaska. That's uh, what? Uh, thousand miles from here yeah give or take give or take yeah and uh, so here's a picture of rich i think in uh, your natural habitat is that about right is that juno in the background yes that's looking looking south my wife took that on the new seawalk in juno this last winter uh-huh and so you're uh, was that across the water or something there i don't uh well, that's the uh, that's the Coast Guard dock in the back, and then uh -huh. the downtown Juno is just over my right shoulder. Uh huh. Gasno Channel is the water you're seeing to the left. All right. My, All right. My, yeah. So I have a question then. Uh, what do you know? What this is? That looks like Nugget Falls. Yes, you say hey, that's what? Like. That, uh, they, they represented that to me that that was uh, off of Mendenhall Glacier. Is that right? Yes, Nugget Falls. Yeah, it's about a mile of a walk, a mile walk from the parking lot, maybe a mile and a half. That looks like a beautiful thing. Do you, do you ever go out there? Uh, I've been out there probably three times in the last year. Uh -huh. Very nice walk. And uh, if we have friends in town, we take them to see that if they're willing to go there. Yeah. You can you can walk right up to the nearly the edge of the falls you can see on the edge of the sand there. So if that's not like the falls out at uh, Simina Falls out in Lake Clark where the Bigfoot lives underneath the falls. That's not legend there. No, I have not heard that one. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I, I suspect that's not true. Uh, <laughs> Rich, we're going to have a little bit of fun today. Uh, we're going to have a couple of drawings. One of those drawings is going to be for a readers and writers t-shirt, something new. For the book club, you can see the logo and the nice, uh, uh, I think they call that uh, some kind of what, uh, celestial blue or something like that. And has the, the logo on it. You can see the, the logo that's a little bit bigger. Uh, and uh, we'll have a drawing a little bit later on for that. And then we'll also, uh, we'll have a, another drawing, two drawings, and we'll have another draw, drawing for Alaska, Alaska, an exciting uh, educational uh, uh, book. So anyway, that's, that's the plan for uh, here during the, the event today, uh, interviewing with Rich Ritter, uh, author, mastermind member. Rich, uh, You've had uh, a lot of experiences that had nothing to do with writing a book. Uh, you uh, started out uh, uh, way back when, let's see, bring this up to date. You graduated from Cal Poly San, San, Luis, San Luis Obispo. Tell us about that. What was that? What did you go to school for? You, it, it was in journalism or writing or what was you there for? No, oh, no, I went. I went there to uh, to go to architecture school. Yes. So uh, when I when I was about eight years old, my parents gave me a book titled "The Natural House" by Frank Lloyd Wright, and I was absolutely fascinated with it. And then it turned out that my dad had uh, uh, completed one year in architecture school at Iowa State before he enlisted in the US Army during World War II. And he still had his drafting set, so he gave it to me. So uh, I decided to become an architect when I was about eight. And really? of course, at that time, my parents said, yeah, that's nice. 
uh, but uh, because I'm a, a nerd, I just stayed with it when all the way through. <laughs> and you have since retired. Yes, I retired in 2007 after. Okay, nearly I'll, have to, years. I'll have to ask the question then, uh, Rich. What did you retire to? I retired to home homemaking, uh, yard work, uh, the Juno Symphony, and writing edgy historical fiction. Although I was already doing that uh, about 20, 20 years ago, I started seriously said, writing. You said something about the symphony. Yes, yes. I, I, uh, I joined the Juno Symphony in 1977. I arrived in Juno in 1976, and I've been playing with them ever since. <laughs> you play what, Rich? Well, right, I'm a percussionist. A percussionist. I have a picture of you percussionating. Is that, is that a good word? Uh, I, it's a new word. I, I think I might use it in one of my books. Okay, so I'm going to show that uh, picture uh, so that the folks at home uh, are able to see uh, Rich Ritter, the percussionist in action. So yep. tell us about that, Rich. What, what do you do? Like, well, that, the that's the timpani. And so right, right now I'm uh, primarily playing timpani. But over the years, I've played just about everything. Uh, snare drum, bass drum, cymbals, xylophone, glockenspiel, marimba. It was everything there is. My favorites are tambourine and triangle, believe it or not. Wow, really? Yeah. Now, I, I understand, Rich, from uh, talking with you earlier today, that you might have an event coming up relative to one of your books uh, and, this, and the symphony. Tell us about that. Oh, well, I, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to finish the third book of the trilogy, the North Things to Come uh, trilogy of the American West. Uh -huh. so that's, uh, uh, I've actually have the manuscript completely wrapped up and I'm making a copy. I'm gonna give it to a friend to do one last read through and then I'm gonna send it to you. Okay, so that wasn't what I was talking about. Yeah, you, you earlier today you told me something about the symphony and your one of your earlier books, Abigail. Oh well, um, uh, you used big words that I didn't even understand, and the people that was in the group we were talking to, they didn't understand it either. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the the um, the Abigail book was featured uh, one time uh, in the. Uh, in the in the uh, at one of the symphony concerts some years years ago when it came out, huh. they they ran a little page on the back of the program and had a photograph of me holding some drumsticks and then uh, a nice photograph of it. Uh, it was a cute little book, Rick. I should say it that like it's a cute little book. That's that's not uh, not not really the way I should say that. It's a really nice book. And uh, well, we're we're kind of looking forward to seeing it in in the symphony and sound. Oh, <laughs> Rich, you've got some uh, folks that are uh, watching this uh, Facebook Live, and they uh, have some comments that we can maybe talk about. Uh, I, uh, well, let's just start with this one. Uh, this is a nice comment. Uh, Marianne says. You're looking good, Rich. Thank so you. That was a nice call. Now, be, be careful. She did not say you're good looking. She said you're looking good. There's a difference. I, I think she's reacting to my shirt instead of the normal sweater that I wear. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> you're not in your normal habitat, your normal yeah. costume. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> oh. So, so uh, Rich, you uh, uh, we uh, use your tagline, the new voice of the American West. And uh, so um, uh, Mar uh, Marty asks, why the West? I mean, uh, you're in Juneau, Alaska. That's the North. Why the West? Well, I, I grew up in Southern California. That's the West. <laughs> yes, it is. And so... Um, uh, you know, I, I've always had a fascination with Western culture, the Wild West, all of the stories, the pulp fiction Westerns. Uh, I love Western movies. And so um, the first book I wrote was not about the West, but then I was about to embark on on um, North Things to Gum, a novel of the American West. And, and my wife uh, said, you know, before you spend 
uh, a bunch of time writing another huge book. Why don't you write something smaller and funner? And so I, I said, like what? And she said, well, why don't you write about the gold mining history of Juno? And so that's where Abigail came from. Uh -huh. So before, before I embarked on the big novel, which ended up to be about 270,000 words, uh, I wrote, um, wrote Abigail. And uh, I used as a model the Christmas box, which was about 18,000 words. That was my original goal. Uh, I ended up at 28,000 words, so I missed by 10,000, but that's okay. And then, <laughs> well, and then that I, is a, that's a big stretch. Yeah. <laughs> then I illustrated the book with historic photographs from the Alaska State Museum, the University of Anchorage, and University of Alaska Fairbanks. And so uh, that was that was very interesting. So every chapter has a photograph that illustrates the storyline. Uh -huh. uh, James from South Africa asks, Rich, just what keeps you going? What motivates you? You know, I, I think uh, um, I, I love to write. I've been writing since um, a very young age. And, uh, you know, when I, when I think back, um, I think the greatest thing that's led to my success has been the ability to become interested in anything. So even in college, if I was taking a class that was really boring, I somehow had this gift to, uh, to trick myself into becoming interested in the class. So I don't know where that comes from, but it's, it's there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so living in Juneau, Alaska, is that a, something boring that you're trying to uh, no that that one's okay i can that I is okay to... huh all right <laughs> so, so uh, i have a little video here rich that i'd like to just show for a second and i i, I know that this isn't juno but i think it represents the area in which you live and i think people uh back uh listening to to this uh, interview today would be interested in it I know that uh, James from South Africa was would be interested in seeing how uh, where uh, Rich lives. So let's just see if we can make this work. Oh, well, there we go. Does that look like about Southeast Alaska? It sure does. But that's not Juno. That that's some some other community. But it sure is uh, Southeast Alaska, is it not? Yeah. 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 Well, so that's that's where Rich lives, is in that area right there, uh, James. Different than uh, South Africa yeah. by quite a bit. And of course, yeah. you may or may not know that there are no roads into Juneau. The only way you can go someplace else from Juneau is by boat or plane. So uh, in Juneau, is this where they say that there's just two places to go, the end of the road or the other end of the road? That's pretty much correct, yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. We, we actually uh, have a, a double ends of the road. You can be on the mainland and go to each end, or you can cross the bridge onto gas, across Gasno Channel into Douglas Island, and you can go to those ends of the roads too. Uh -huh. so we, have, we have two roads, each with an end. Oh, so you have twice as many roads as Ketchikan. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so you're, yeah, okay. Carl Douglas uh, asks uh, about the, the West, and he says, you're not talking about California. You're talking about the real West. Correct. Yeah. Not. The, uh, yeah, okay. So the trilogy when you, actually takes place um, primarily in Silver City, Idaho, uh -huh. uh, during a period of around 18, 1868, 1872. Um, but the primary characters travel from all over the world to get there, starting with the second book of the trilogy. Okay. Uh, here's a question. I don't know anything about this. I thought I knew something about Juno so I could ask in intelligent questions, Rich, knowing the answer. But uh, Valerie says, she says she loves the tram to the top of the mountain in Juno. Yes. That's, there, what, what is that? Uh, there, it goes from the, uh, one, of the, one of the cruise ship docks down by uh -huh. the Gasman Channel, and it goes up, up to... Uh, Mount Roberts Mountain goes goes about 2,000 feet. Once you get up there, they've got shops and restaurants and a little theater, and they have a display of a, of a wild bald eagle, and then you can take a number of trails up to the top of the mountain. And 
and uh, so it's very popular. So, but it's not a ski tram. It's a no, tourist no, it, kind of a tourist trap kind of a tram. Yeah, Is that it, yeah? Yes. Oh, okay. But there's also a, a Mount Roberts Trail going down the backside, and so they uh, it's run by Gold Belt Corporation, one of the natives corporations. So if you uh -huh. if you hike up the backside on uh, Mount Roberts Trail, then they will give you a free ride down the other side to the base. Do they have many? <laughs> they have many people take them up on that. I. I believe they have a few. It's uh, I, I don't. I'm not aware of any tourists that do that because that would be unusual. But sometimes the locals do it. Have but you ever done it? I've never done it. It's yeah, okay. uh, the, trail, the trail varies in quality depending on the weather. Yeah. Well, so uh, rain, normally it can be pretty muddy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it. How many rain-free days does Juno have? I know Petersburg has 37 rain-free days. I think Geno's has a little more sunshine than yeah, that. Yeah, we generally average 60 to 70 sunny days a year. Uh-huh, yeah. So, um, what, but this uh, tram, uh, Valerie wants to know, have you, you ever used that in your uh, riding? She says it's a oh. magical place, I, a good setting for something. Have you ever used it? No, I ha I've never used it for uh, any, any riding. Um, uh -huh. But I'm sure one of the other author mine masters could use it for some mystical event or some murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> it's a long ways from uh, Silver City, Idaho. Yeah. For your Western books. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I wanted to just uh, maybe we'll get uh, something else here, Rich. I wanted to show a picture of uh, of you and ask you a question. You've done a, a lot of interesting things in your life. And uh, so one of the questions that I wanted to ask is, uh, uh, what are some of those interesting things that you've done besides writing, writing books? Just the, just the living things that you do. Well, I, I actually, uh, the architecture program at Cal Poly was a, a five-year professional degree. And I was sitting in my room near the end of the fourth year, and my first year college roommate came by and said, hey, let's go to Denmark next year. And I said, okay. And so we, they had a program where you could finish your fifth year in Denmark and get full Cal Poly credits. And so I spent my fifth year in uh, Denmark. I lived in Rydalor the first semester. I lived in Gamal Hall to the second semester. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then I traveled by myself for five weeks around Europe during the Christmas break and including going through Checkpoint Charlie in West Berlin. Uh, and then uh, during the spring, uh, when I met Chris, she actually came over for the second semester. Um, we both went on a tour, uh, about 17 of us, to Leningrad and Moscow in 1975. Who's Chris? Was, uh, Who's Chris? Oh, my wife. Okay, so, so you met your wife in Denmark. Yeah, we actually I met her in Denmark, but we, we both signed up for the same student tour to Leningrad and Moscow. And which is about a 10 day tour. And then we ended up hanging out together for the whole 10 days, which I guess was oh. sort of a date, but I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris knew it. She had the designs, I, I suspect. She's never admitted to that, even though I've oh. asked her a few times. Oh, okay. So Chris, <laughs> Chris, as I understand, was from Juneau, Alaska. You'd never been to Alaska? Yeah, she was born in, in Juneau. Uh-huh. Those rare people that are actually born here. And, uh, and she was uh, attending uh, the architecture program at the University of Idaho. And then so I, I was there for the entire year and, and she was there the second semester. I see, okay. And you got together and then got married, moved to yep. Juneau, Alaska, and you've been there since. Right, well, when I, okay. when I came back to California, if you all remember, that was the, the economy was really having a hard time and inflation was double digits. and. I tried to get work in Southern California for about three months after I came back and I just wasn't finding anything. And then Chris said, well, why don't you come up to Juno? They're hiring here. That would have been 76. And I came up and got a job within two months. Good for you. Well, we're gl glad you did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now uh, you have two sons. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Correct. Uh, yes. And both are adopted. Both are adopted. Yeah. yeah we tell, adopted tell both us. of them within a few days of birth. Uh -huh. Tell us about your two sons. Who, 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 what, are, what and who are they now? Well, our oldest son is, uh, um, he's actually working for a, a private drone company right now. 
He's uh, currently in Afghanistan at Camp Leatherneck flying drones, reconnaissance drones. Uh -huh. uh, and our youngest son is working at the Pike's Market. He's a line chef at the uh, Pike's Brew House. Really? Huh. Yeah. And yeah. so that, that's that's where they ended up. They, they it was interesting. Uh, uh, we both had uh, they both had some issues, adoption issues. My wife and I have been embroiled in what it means to adopt a child. Their their senses of abandonment and other issues. We had a they were both delightful until early teens, and then the rails the wheels came off, and and then uh, uh, we had some we had some interesting times, but. Um, Things finally turned around when my son, the oldest son, turned 21. He'd been in the Marine Corps, and he called once and asked my advice. That was the first time he'd actually talked to me in that regard for about 10 years. Yeah, well, he, he found out that uh, his dad did, didn't know something after all. Well, for some reason, he finally concluded that I wasn't as stupid as thought, and so he thought yeah, he better yeah. give me a call about something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kids, kids have a way of uh, doing that. Uh, Rich, I have a photograph of you, and I'd like to uh, have you explain that to us. Tell us what this is all about. Can you see that photograph? Oh, uh, I, yeah, I see it. Chris and I took a tour to Southern Africa in 2009, uh -huh. and uh, this, is, this is in Zimbabwe, which I don't know how they're doing now, but they were okay at the time. So I actually, even though I write edgy Western historical fiction, I'm not a big fan of horses like Victoria, one of the author masterminds. I, I really prefer not to ride them. So I should have known better. Chris, Chris, who loves to ride horses, talked me into taking an elephant ride. And uh, I thought, well, this can't be as bad as a horse. And so I went ahead and went on the ride. And, and the first thing that happened is someone up in front of us dropped their camera lens off their elephant. So this, this elephant, uh, they said she was a very gentle female named Tatu. Uh, she reached down with her trunk and picked up that darn camera lens and handed it up to the guide. And and then she ran to catch up with the other elephant to give the lens, to, <laughs> which was worse <laughs> than a horse, actually. I thought I was going to die. And and then after that, this gentle female elephant uh, wraps her trunk around a three-inch round tree and rips it out of the ground and starts munching on it. Horses I, don't do that. Even horses don't do that. Then I really <laughs> knew we were going to die. <laughs> <laughs> but we managed to finish without getting killed, so I was pleased with that. I, I guess I won't be so hard on horses anymore. But Chris thought it was great. But that's who she is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, you're not going back and ride elephants again, or you are? Yeah, probably not. I, yeah. uh, we'll see. Maybe she'll talk me into it again. <laughs> yeah, this perhaps this was just one in a row, but maybe not. <laughs> uh, I've got a little video here. Uh, uh, Rich, that I'd like to show. So a lot of people have seen this because uh, this was on uh, the readers and uh, writers uh, group uh, some time ago. But let's just show this and, and see what uh, you think about this. Where did, what is all this about? Basketball uh, in uh, Rich's backyard. Now, tell us about that. What was all that about, Rich? That looks like it was kind of a stage deal, but what was it about? Well, I got I got this hankering to shoot some hoops last winter, and uh, uh, so I I thought, well, shoot, I'll just put I'll put the cell phone out here and and uh, film myself. So I have two comments. That was a first take. It was so good, I didn't have to do any more takes. And the total cost of the production was less than $2. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a new basketball. A, a basketball, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rich, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, your books, a couple of them for just a minute. 
I, I guess I want to put a, uh, would want to talk about where you started. I'll see if I've got that uh, picture of, the, of your book, because I'd wanted to show the cover of it. Let's just talk about your uh, first book. Uh, this book was before uh, you and I ever became acquainted. Tell us uh, not about the book and the story, but the backstory about Rich and how this came about and why did you write it? And, you know, yeah. talk about well, that. I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd mentioned that uh, when our sons turned 11, 12, we started having some fairly serious issues. And we learned through various avenues that those were adoption related. We ended up having to send both of them to a special school uh, because they, things got out of hand so seriously. And uh, part of that program were a series of seminars that uh, parents were encouraged to attend. So Chris and I attended all the seminars. They were like three to four day affairs down in Seattle. And um, during the third seminar at the very end, uh, uh, the night before the final day, they, they went through a series of exercises. And then they wanted you to, when the, the moment you woke up in the morning, they wanted you to write something on a piece of paper and that was your primary purpose in life. And so when I got up the next morning, I wrote author. Just what, this is what came to my mind. And then at the, uh, during that day, you had to commit to what they called uh, a big bodacious goal. And so I committed to writing a novel. And uh, unfortunately, I might have overdone it because the woman in the chair next to me, uh, she committed to taking a multivitamin every day. Uh, <laughs> So, but the, the book is a, the book is uh, primarily about an adopted son who does not believe he was, is worthy of love. Wow. And uh, that, a lot of that was inspired by my, um, the book takes place in part in, in Korea during the Korean war, part in Oregon as the child is growing up. And uh, I was inspired by my dad who was in the army and fought in the Philippines and in, in Korea. And uh, my oldest son, who was uh, a Marine, and my youngest son, who also had issues that are reflected in the book. So the, the book is semi-autobiographical. So none of the stories are exactly as something may have happened, but there's a lot of, uh, of personal experiences woven through the storyline. So that's where well, that... Rich, if we were to read Toil Under the Sun, we would learn some things about Rich Ritter that maybe yeah, we don't know. But, yes, uh -huh. you would. Yes. Yeah. Good. Huh. And so then uh, your, your next book, and this is when you and I got acquainted, was the book we talked about earlier, The Heart of Abigail. And yes. so this this is, is an expanded book that you thought you was going to write much shorter. Yes, actually, it's uh, I consider it a, a warm up to the trilogy, uh, the book that Chris suggested. And so uh, after Toil Under the Sun, I wasn't terribly pleased with the publisher, so I I um, actually did uh, research. I started visiting bookstores in Juneau. There's uh, two bookstores, three bookstores, and and uh, I was in Costco one day, and I walked by a pile of books that I thought were very handsome, and so I picked them up, and I said, wow, who published this? And it said publication consultants. Mm -hmm. And so I got your name and contacted you, and uh, and that's where it started. And okay, I, thanks. So uh, just to, just to clear. Every book I've published has been with uh, publication consultants since then. Yeah, thank you. Just to kind of make things square to everyone that may not know, uh, publication consultants is a book publisher that sponsors author masterminds. And author masterminds uh, sponsors the Readers and Writers Book Club, which is wh who is sponsoring this interview today. And, and it's on the Readers and Writers Book Club group on Facebook, Facebook Live event. Uh, so let's look, let's look at this one then, Rich. The, another book that he was talking about uh, that you came out with was the, uh, the Perilous Journey Begins. This is the, uh, the first book in your series. Again, let's not talk about the book so much as about what inspired you to get here to even write the book? And how did you go about, how did you pick Idaho and, you know, what all about it? Well, my, my, uh, my wife's uh, freshman year room uh, lives in Caldwell, Idaho. 
and he has a home in Silver City. Silver City is is the best preserved ghost town in the country. And uh, there are about 80 or 85 people who maintain residences there. And uh, you, you can only do things to your residence that are historically accurate. You can't even paint it a different color. And so we had visited her place, stayed with her four or five times over the years. And uh, I was so fond of the place and so enchanted by the area that, uh, and I decided that I wanted to write something about that area. And because of my natural uh, love of the West and the stories of the West, I, I chose to write a novel about the West and, and uh, center it in Silver City, Idaho. And so I'd actually made several more trips to do research uh, after, uh, during the writing of the book. And uh, a, a few years ago, I actually did a book signing there during their, uh, every, every year that during uh, September, they have a, uh, they open 10 homes and, and hundreds of tourists come there, six or 700. And I took a box of 24 there and, and sold them all. Sat out in front of the, uh, the fire hall. In, uh, in, uh, in the in the little Silver. town in Silver City. Yeah, yep. I'll be darned. Uh, uh, Marty uh, asked a question that you answered, but uh, he, then he has a follow-up question about that. He, obviously, you have visited. He asked the question, have you ever been to the ghost town Florence, Idaho? You know, I have never been to Florence, Idaho, um, but I I'll, I'll put that on my list, Marty. <laughs> now, uh, you've retired from Juno or from architecture. You're into writing, but you're also uh, going to retire from Juno here in a yes, my, short period my of time. Wife and I to Idaho. Yes. My wife and I purchased a home in Garden City, Idaho, which is about seven, eight miles northwesterly of Boise. Um, we had actually been looking all over the Pacific Northwest, and uh, we hadn't come up with anything uh, that really interested us. And then we found this home on Zillow one Friday night, one Thursday night, I should say, and then we were on the plane Saturday. Um, and uh, we're both very familiar with the area. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Chris's college roommate, Vaughn, lives there. Her whole family lives there, and we've had a connection with him for 30 years. Uh, we have another several close friends from Juno who moved there, and so it it seemed like a good fit. So and we bought far? the home, but we we didn't make the move. Uh, how far is uh, Garden City, Idaho, from uh, from the setting of your book in Silver City? About about three to four hours. Oh, so it's a distance. It's uh, it's about a. It's about three and a half hours from Caldwell. When we when we've gone there, we've always gone with our with our friend in her SUV, uh, and so it's about a half hour drive from Garden City to Caldwell, and it's about three and a half from Caldwell to Silver City. You have to go go through Murphy, and then you take the road. It's it's a rugged road, lots of potholes. It's dirt, turns and turns this way, hairpins, um, and uh, it's a good good three and a half hour drive from from Caldwell. But it's not uh, three and a half hours on the freeway. Uh, the first little part is, but then you soon get off more secondary roads, and then you then you get off of tertiary roads, and pretty soon you turn to Silver City and you're on a dirt road. Okay, let's uh, Rich, let's talk about uh, the the second book in uh, your series, uh, the trilogy. Uh, this one, the Gathering of the Clans. Uh, tell us about that again. Not so much about the story. People can read the story and they can get the get the book on Amazon or wherever and, and get the get that. But let's talk about the, the how it came about and how did you come up with the story for Pete's sakes? Well, interestingly, the the second book uh, began with all of the seven primary crews arriving in Silver City. The first book is of their adventures and travels from distances to Silver, nearly to Silver City. And so once I get to the second book, the, the influences of having visited there and stayed there start to really kick in. So that photograph on the front is actually one I took um, from the porch of my friend's cabin during a beautiful afternoon, late afternoon, um, 
the church on the right side is featured in the book, although I've had to take some some license. It is our work of fiction, after all. The church wasn't built until around 1892, so I, I moved it back 20 years to feature in the story, which takes place primarily around 1872. So it's a, it's a Catholic church, and it's, uh, as I said, it dates from 1892, and uh, they still have services there once a month. The Catholic okay. priest <laughs> comes in with the and they service. Okay, so let me get this straight. This is a ghost town. Yes. Okay, and you have a friend that lives in the ghost town. Well, actually, she lives in Caldwell, and she maintains a quote-unquote cabin that has running water and, le and electricity from solar panels. And she just put in a propane uh, refrigerator freezer, so it's getting pretty luxurious. Starting to not feel like Silver City anymore to me. I guess I can't stop that. <laughs> so, but 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 it's, but it's a ghost town, ghost town, yes. and and yes. there's a Catholic church so, in the ghost town. Yes. So the the parishioners and there are the winter, ghosts they, or what? Well, there's actually there's uh, the Idaho Hotel is still there. The Idaho Hotel oh, yeah? existed in in the 1860s, and uh, supposedly there are claims of of ghosts that that uh, frequent some of the rooms. You can still stay there. They have like six or seven rooms, and if you you have to give them a couple of weeks' notice uh, so they know you're coming, and they get a room for you, and then they prepare dinner and breakfast every day. Uh, based on your schedule. So uh, but I, I've been told there are ghosts there, uh, but I haven't seen any. So, so you, have you ever stayed at the hotel? Uh, no, no, Evan, it's a ghost center. Why would I do that? Well, I don't know, just to get acquainted with the ghosts. You know, you're a writer <laughs> after all. <laughs> oh, well, maybe I'll send over Chris. She'd probably do it. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Syl arrived late, obviously, because of her question, but I'm going to ask the question and then give you an opportunity to explain that a little more detail, maybe, to Chris. Chris asks, or Syl asks, she says, she says, are you, were you a cowboy in a previous life? Um, you know, that's very possible, but I, I have this, I really don't like horses very much, so that's, if, if I if I was a cowboy, that that aspect didn't come along. I, <laughs> so I, I know about horses, and I I've actually, I've actually uh, interviewed some real cowboys, so I make sure that I get everything right about it. Uh, but <laughs> but I'm not fond of riding them. I've ridden some horses, and I've I've gone to some rodeos, and I know some cowboys. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm not a big fan of riding them. <laughs> you made that very that point earlier. So, so uh, right now he, he may have been a rich may have been a cowboy in a former life, but not this life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Carl asks, uh, "Are you aware of A L M Y Almy, Wyoming, and its mining disaster that killed the town? Uh, Almost no. all of the cemetery stones have the same date of death." Even the time of day seems like it. Uh, he, uh, Carl says it seems like that's your kind of story. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. I'm not aware of that. I'm not familiar with that story. Yeah, I you shall. Know, I shall look it up. It sounds fascinating. A L M Y Almy Almy Idaho or Wyoming. Yeah. Well, Rich, is there anything that you would like to tell us that you haven't already told us? that you think would be important for us to know? Um, I think uh, I'd like to say that I'm open to communicating and discussing anything with anybody. So if anyone has any questions about what I do or my background, I'm glad to talk to them. I think that's, I think that's true of all, the, all of the author masterminds. I think it's a very engaging group that's easy to talk to and the people are fascinating and I'm glad to be part of that. Well, we're, we're pleased that you've been here today, uh, Rich, and to get to know you just a little bit better. Uh, it's been pleasant. I've uh, known you for how many years? Better than 10 about, years, Rich. About, and, about 10 or 11 years, yeah. Yeah, and preparing for this interview, 
I sure found out a lot about you that I didn't know, and I've come to appreciate you even more. Uh, and it's, it's nice to be associated with you, and I think that uh, the Author Masterminds uh, members will all concur in that, that uh, the more we get to know Rich Ritter, the better we like it. I'm going to uh, just end the, the uh, oh my gosh, we forgot something, Rich. We forgot, I almost forgot entirely. I'm going to come back to it right now. Uh, so that we don't uh, forget this, we are going to have a contest, I mean a drawing, for a Readers and Writers Book Club uh, t-shirt. So here's how it's going to work. Uh, get your pencil out and write this email address down. And just the, the email address is evan, E-V-A-N, at publication consultants.com. That's all lowercase, all one word, evan at publicationconsultants.com. And send me an email and say, I want to win a readers and writers t-shirt. I want to win a readers and writers t-shirt. We'll put you in the hat, draw you out. And if you win, you will send you a brand new readers and writers book club t-shirt. And then in addition to that, let's put this up and say, how about the uh, Alaska, Alaska card game? If you want to win an Alaska, Alaska card game, do the same thing, same email address, evan at publicationconsultants.com. In the subject line or in the con uh, body of the email, put I want to win an Alaska, Alaska card game. If you want to win both of them, then send two emails. Do not put the same, the, to it on the same email. I'll just disqualify you if you do that. So send one for the t-shirt and one for the, uh, for the uh, Alaska, Alaska game. Anyway, uh, Rich, it has been nice being here with you today. And as we end the day, I just want to end it with uh, the thing that we played earlier that kind of uh, made us all chuckle a little bit. So we'll have it on here twice. I just wanted to show this uh, video just one more time. Thank you, Rich, for being here. Thanks for everyone for being here. On behalf of uh, uh, Readers and Writers good. Book Club, uh, we have enjoyed being here with you today. We'll see you next Tuesday at the same time. However, it'll be a little different. We're going to have a Readers and Writers Book Club members meeting next Tuesday at six o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You'll hear more about that. And I'm sure you'll want to be here. In fact, we're going to invite some club members to be panelists on this at the meeting and talk with us and, and just we'll visit about the book club. Anyway, we'll see you next week. We're pleased that you are here. Uh, come, uh, come again next week for the Readers and Writers Book Club meeting. And in the meantime, keep in touch. <laughs>